boys and girls. We've got such a great group of students that I have the privilege to work with on a weekly basis. I'm so proud of them and the hard work that they put in to uh, put that skit together. I just wanted to put a little plug in for you all. Uh, starting in May on Sunday nights, uh, the first Sunday night of the month in May, June, and July, we're going to have Youth Sunday uh, for the service. So you guys are going to get to see more of what the school ministry uh, can bring, and I'm uh, really excited to see them use their gifts and talents to serve the Lord. I'm uh, extremely proud of them this morning. Here. And uh, let me just ask you to start off. How many of you can relate to some of the things that were said in that skit? Maybe you try to pray and you feel like that the words aren't getting anywhere past the ceiling. Maybe you feel like you've been trying to, to hear from God and He's just not speaking to you. Maybe you feel like that uh, God is, is someone you, you don't even know how to talk to because you don't have the right words. You, you can't form the right sentence and so you don't pray. See, for many of us, we look at prayer as a challenge to us. And so if you're here this morning and you've ever felt like God was not listening to your prayer, if you're here this morning and you ever felt like that God might not have been paying attention to your situation, or that He was silent when you needed a response, then this message is for you. Let me just get a quick show of hands. If you've ever felt like that, if you ever felt like God wasn't paying attention, if you ever wondered why God wasn't responding or that He might be silent, would you just raise your hand real quick? Good. Now what I want you to do is I want you to see all those hands that were raised. Because one of the biggest lies that we buy into is that we feel guilty because we think we're the only ones that feel that way. But I guarantee that any person that has struggled with their faith has felt that way from one time or another. You're praying and you just feel like maybe your prayers aren't getting through to God. And so this morning, what I hope for you my hope is that each one of us can see that when we go through a period of wilderness, we can still maintain our faith. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just come once again to you. So thankful for this morning, thankful for this opportunity to worship you, to gather together, to sing your praise. And so God, I pray that as we look at your word, that we would get out of the way, that our distractions would go away, and that we would hear from you this morning. You would speak through us and to us. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So many of us, we wonder, we ask the question, if God is silent in our lives, does that mean that He's absent? Maybe you're in a period of spiritual drought. You feel like, I haven't heard from God in a long time. Maybe He isn't answering my prayers like I hoped that He would. Well, I want you to know that you're not alone this morning. In fact, the message we're going to look at is someone in the Bible who had a tremendous relationship with God. This is a character that knew Jesus personally, that heard from God, that had a great ministry, that fulfilled that ministry of God, and yet went through a period of doubt. When he felt like God was not speaking to him, and it made him question his entire faith. The person we're going to look at this morning is John the Baptist. We're going to be reading... His story beginning in John chapter 1 and verse 19. Now the message this morning is one that I'm adapting for our situation from a message that Andy Stanley gave called When God. And in the story of John, we're going to see that even those that have a tremendous walk with God can struggle with this now. And so I hope this encourages you this morning. As we begin reading John chapter 1 beginning in verse 19. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him then, Who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, No, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Finally they said, Well, who are you? Give us an answer and take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? So John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Verse 29. Then the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one who I meant when I said, A man comes after me who has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. 
And then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. John had an incredible testimony. He had an incredible life. The things that John got to experience, just look at some of these. The things that he got to experience. First thing was that he was a part of Jesus' earthly family. We didn't read it in the text there, but does anybody know Jesus or that John had a famous cousin? You know who that cousin was? Jesus. So he knew Jesus growing up. They, they were in the same family together, so he knew who Jesus was. He received a special calling from God. I don't know if you picked up on it, but it said that God actually spoke to him and told him that the one who you see the Holy Spirit descend on like a dove is my chosen one. So God spoke to John the Baptist. He had a clear mission in life. When they asked him, are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet? Who are you? He said, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. He knew his calling and his purpose in life. And he was extremely successful. People were coming from all around to be baptized by John. They were listening to his words of repentance and their hearts were being prepared for what Jesus was about to do. He baptized Jesus. He was witness to the very beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. He heard the voice of God say to him, This is my son whom I love, and him I am well pleased. He says, without a doubt, this is the chosen one of God because he saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him. John saw amazing things. Firsthand, eyewitness, if anybody had faith, it was John. Because of what he got to experience and what he got to do for the Lord. And it didn't just end at Jesus' baptism. Let's look ahead at his story, John chapter 3. Beginning in verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out to the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in the Anon near Sodom, because there was plenty of water and people were coming there to be baptized. Now this was before John was put in prison. Pause right there for just a second. Keep your thumb there or make a little note there. This was before John was put in prison. Why was John put in prison? <coughs> We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Well, let's continue reading. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, Jesus, the one who was with you on the other side of the Jordan that you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. So John's disciples were coming to him and saying, hey, listen, we're, we're, kind of, we're kind of losing out here. Everybody is leaving us and going to Jesus. Shouldn't we do something about that? But to this, John replied, a person can only receive what is given to them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm the one sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it's now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. John the Baptist never stopped pointing people to Jesus. Even when his ministry was starting to wind down, even when people were leaving him, his own followers were leaving him and going to Jesus, John didn't get jealous. He didn't try to compete. He didn't fight back. He just pointed people to Jesus. John was humble. John understood his mission. He didn't have jealousy in his heart. But somehow John ended up in prison. How did John get there? Because he spoke boldly against sin and against corruption. <clears throat> he was doing everything right. And because John was doing everything right, he got punished for it. You read the story in Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. 
For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he married. Now let's pause right there. What is going on in this scene? Herod was the king of Galilee. He had a brother named Philip who was married to a woman named Herodias. He had an affair with her. It was a first century soap opera right here. He took his brother's wife as his own and married her. Now for Herodias, this was probably a power play. She's now the queen of the land. She probably saw it as a step up, and so there's this corruption that's going on in the Jewish government. And John speaks out against it. Continue in verse 18. He had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, but yet he liked to listen to him. Isn't that strange? Herod liked to listen to what John had to say. There was something compelling about his words, even though he was telling him, you're living in sin. It's like, yeah, okay, John, forget about that part. I don't, I don't need to hear that. Tell me more about Jesus. Tell me more about God. I, I don't need to hear about my sin. Sometimes we act that way, too. But in this first century soap opera, John is proclaiming the truth. He is telling Herod to repent of his sin, just like he told everyone else who came to him in the Jordan River. John experienced a calling from God unlike anyone else. He served God faithfully by preparing the way for Jesus. He handed over the ministry. He pointed people to Jesus when his ministry was decreasing. But yet he continued to stand for what was right and true. And because of that, he ended up in prison. If anyone in this world had earned a miracle, if anyone had earned God's intervention, you would think it was John. But no. He sits there, waiting in a prison, not knowing what the future is going to hold. And so he hears about Jesus' ministry. He sees that uh, the reports are coming back of what Jesus is doing in the land. And he has some of his friends come and visit him in prison. And he asks a question. This is a question that we just skip over when we think of the life of John the Baptist. But this question gives us a clue into what he was struggling with inside this prison. And it gives us hope. Because we have some of those same questions that John has. And even though John had amazing faith and amazing experience with God, he still struggled. The question comes in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Are you the one, or should we expect someone else? Wait, what? What is John asking? He's questioning if Jesus is the one, Jesus, who he saw the Holy Spirit descend on, who he proudly testified, this is the chosen one of God. I must become less, he must become greater. Up until that point, he was pointing everyone boldly and confidently toward Jesus. And now he's questioning, are you even the real one? Are you the Messiah or is there someone else? What? changed for John. It was a circumstance. John was in prison. All he could see around him were those prison walls. He lost sight of anything else that was going on in his life and in the world. You see, pain has a way of shrinking our world down to where all we can see is that prison around us. And John, for all of his faith and all of his experience, was in that place. And so he has doubts. He couldn't see past his own prison. It's all he could focus on. Imagine what his friends are saying. He said, but John, you're the one that told us about Jesus. We came to him because of you, and now you're asking 
Is he the one? And John says, I know, guys, I know, but I just didn't think my life would turn out this way. I just didn't think I'd be in this place for so long. I didn't think that God would leave me here. I've been trying to pray and I just don't hear from Him. I just need to hear something. I need to know. Because God seems silent. And it makes me wonder, is He absent from my life? John was in a prison, both physically, he was in a prison, but emotionally, and spiritually. He was struggling. He needed to know. Isn't it interesting that when our circumstances change, that our confidence in God changes? Think about it. When things are going right, when things are going good, when you feel like your life is on the track you believe it should be on, it's really easy to believe in God. You think, God's blessing me. I, I feel on fire for the Lord. But when you get that diagnosis, when you lose that job, when something tragic happens in your life, you start to wonder where God is. Why is He letting me go through this? You know, if we're really honest with ourselves, this attitude is, is actually pretty self-centered. Because if you think about it, we all struggle with this. But when we hear of a tragedy happening to someone else, it doesn't shake our faith the same way it does when it happens to us. Just yesterday, maybe you heard about the earthquake in Ecuador. And so when we hear about terrible things like that where, where dozens, maybe hundreds of people have lost their lives, our response is to grieve. Our response is to pray. It's to try to send help through whatever organizations we can, through missionaries that are in that land. But usually it doesn't make us question our faith. But if it happens to us, then we start to wonder where God is. It's like we feel God's presence is different because our circumstance is different. Now, we, we know in our head that doesn't make sense, but that's real, isn't it? Isn't that the way we feel? We wonder why God would let us go through something. You see, when you struggle, I'll pray. But if I struggle, then I doubt. And no one is immune to this. We've all experienced those seasons before. Pain shrinks us down to where we can see nothing else. And that's where John is this, in this message this morning. And so he sends his friends, he says, go ask Jesus this, and they do it. I'm sure it was awkward for them. Excuse me, Jesus, I know you're busy healing and doing miracles, but you know your cousin John that you left in prison? He had this question that he needed to know. Are you really the one? I love what Jesus says. I love how Jesus responds to him. Notice Jesus doesn't say, Silly John, of course I'm the one. Go tell him. Yeah, yeah, I'm the one. Just don't, you know, fuck up. I'm the one. He doesn't say that. And he doesn't say, Yes, and listen, we're breaking him out tonight. He doesn't say that either. No, what Jesus says can be found in verses 4 and 5. Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, dead people are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. He tells John's friends, You go back and you tell them what you see. Because John can't see it. John is in his prison and all he sees is the wall in front of him. That's why it's so important that if you're not in that place, if you're not in the wilderness, if you're not in the dry season right now, that you are sharing your faith with others about what God is doing in your life. You have no idea who you could be encouraging, who might need to hear that God is still alive and well and active in our world. Just a couple of weeks ago, we went to Louisville on spring break to visit some family. And one of the things that we did is we got to see my wife's grandfather, who was in a rehab facility. He just had his second knee replacement done, and he was struggling. The first one went a lot easier. This one was a pain for him to deal with. And so he was in this rehab facility, and we could tell that his spirits were down. 
that all he saw around him were the walls of his room. And so as he's telling us, he, he's, he's getting sad, he's starting to tear up, he's starting to show the pain that he was trying so hard to hide. But as we spent time with him, we began to share about our family, about our church, about the great things that God was doing in our lives and in the world. And you know what happened? His vision expanded. He didn't just see the walls of his hospital room. He saw that there was more going on in the world. And so if you have the ability to encourage someone else this morning, do it. You don't know where they're at. You don't know how much it can mean to them to lift up their spirits. That is so important that we do that. So as, as John's friends turn and they try to head back to give him this message, Jesus says, well, wait guys, one more thing. One more thing. Verse 6. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, wait a minute. That's what you want us to tell him, Jesus. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Yep. That's what I want you to say. Well, wait a minute, stumble, like fall away, lose faith. You want us to tell them that? Yes, that's what I want you to say. So what you're saying, Jesus, is that you might actually do something that could be difficult for someone to keep their faith through. Yes, Jesus is saying that. Well, wait, Jesus, are you saying that you might not do something, and because you're not doing something, someone might have a struggle with their faith. Yes. That's what Jesus is saying here. So, Jesus is going to leave John in this prison. But he's telling the friends, go bring him word of what is going on in the world around us. Why? Why, why is it? I mean, why isn't Jesus busting him out? Is it because they're cousins? I mean, you know, you have cousins growing up. You fight and you... You compete with one another. That's probably what happened, right? Jesus is just paying back John for all the times he picked on him. John's a little older. Maybe they had a, a bad childhood together. I mean, you know, I've got cousins. We know how cousins fight. That's probably what it is, right? Well, no, because Jesus tells us in verse 11 that there's no one greater that's been born of a woman than John. And that means anyone. That no one is greater in this world than John. And so it wasn't because Jesus was mad at John or because he didn't care about him. In fact, Jesus cared very deeply for who John was. He didn't forget him. He knew him. He knew who he was. He remembered his situation. But why? We've got to stop asking. We cannot ask why to the point where it drives us crazy. It's a trap. It is a trap. And if you've ever experienced deep pain, you know that there is no answer that would ever satisfy you. Why am I going through this? Why did I lose that loved one? Why? It's just a trap. You have to let that question go. But there's an important lesson here. The lesson is this. Your personal circumstances do not necessarily reflect how God feels about you. Your personal circumstances do not necessarily reflect how God feels about you. Because John was loved. John was remembered. He was cared for. He had a mission. He served God faithfully. Jesus says there was no one greater. John wasn't abandoned by God. God just had a bigger purpose going on in the world. So if you want to know how God feels about you, proof of that comes in the cross. You look to the cross of Jesus, not your current situation. Don't look at the hardships that you're facing and think that God is punishing you. Jesus tells John's friends, you need to go back and encourage him by what you see. You need to look outside of your pain. Look outside of your prison to two things, to remember past blessings, and to see God's activity in our world. See, we have such an easy time forgetting. We forget where God's been, how He has answered prayers in the past, what He's done in our lives, 
when we're suffering. But our current situation does not negate God's past activity. So go back and remember. Remember what God's done in your life. Remember how He's been faithful. Remember how He's answered those prayers. And take hold of that. And then look outside of your current situation. Maybe you just need to step out and get some perspective. Maybe you're too close to what's going on. John couldn't get out of prison, so you know what? He needed his friends to help him. Maybe you need to meet with Christian friends that are going to encourage you and point you to the Lord. It's so easy to get focused in on our pain and forget everything else. But we have to look outside, remember our blessings, and look at God's activity in the world. This is for us right here. And if you know the end of the story, you know it doesn't end well for John. John stays in that prison until one day Herodias' daughter dances before King Herod and his guests. King Herod's impressed. He offers her half his kingdom. And then Herodias does something that a teenage daughter usually doesn't do. She says, hang on a minute, let me go ask my mom what I need to do. And so he goes and asks, she goes and asks her mom and she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. And so Herod doesn't want to, but because he's embarrassed, because he doesn't want to lose face in front of his guests, he does it. He beheads John, and that's the end of the story. And just a little while later, another group of religious leaders arrest Jesus unfairly. They beat him, they mock him, all while his friends have abandoned him. And one of them even betrayed him. And God let all that happen. Jesus prayed in the garden, if there would be any way, Lord, any way that this could happen, could go any other way, please let that happen. But God doesn't. Jesus is crucified. And because of that, 2,000 years later, we are here today. Because we have some perspective. We see what God was doing in the world the story of John is here to encourage us. The story of Jesus is here to give us freedom. If God would have answered those prayers the way they had wanted Him to at that time, where would we be today? <coughs> and 2,000 years later, we are still talking about the good news of Jesus. So what I want you to realize this morning is that when God is silent, He is not absent. This is for all of us here today. Just because He seems silent doesn't mean He's absent. You can wake up tomorrow morning confident of who God is. You can wake up tomorrow morning confident that you are loved. Confident that He remembers you. Confident that He has not forgotten. That He is listening to your prayers and trust in Him. He's doing something bigger than you may ever know this side of heaven. Remember our key verse this morning that should bring us encouragement. Matthew 11, verse 6. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Just because God seems silent doesn't mean He's absent. Blessed is any one of us who does not stumble because of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for stories like John's. We're so thankful that the people in the Bible have real struggles that we can relate to. And even though he saw amazing things in his life, that in his pain he still had questions. So, Lord, I thank you that you did not forget John and you have not forgotten us. Lord, I thank you that you loved him and you love us here this morning. And we look to the cross for our faith. Because you spared not your son. He bore our sins and our shame so that we could be made right with you. So Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that's going through the wilderness, give them confidence that their faith can remain strong. 
And if there's anyone here this morning that we can encourage by sharing our faith, let us take that opportunity. We trust you, Lord. We know you're at work. And we know that you love us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray.